good morning, everybody. This is uh, our third lecture in the first week of the course. Uh, I left already in the chat room a message uh, to the effect that I was able to record uh, on Illinois Media Space the two first lectures in case somebody missed a lecture they can go and watch the lecture there but of course with a lower quality than uh, when we have it uh, delivered the first uh, time uh, <clears throat> thank you alvaro for co-hosting uh, the meeting uh, what we would like to do today is follow up on the uh, first chapter on the first reactor that was followed by the Manhattan Project and the use uh, of nuclear energy uh, in war. And uh, uh, what uh, followed it is a situation that you are living in today. These uh, events uh, in the first reactor and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, happened uh, before any of the audience and even the uh, instructor were born. Uh, however, we are still living the effects of that discovery, uh, not of fire for humanity, which was a chem which is a chemical process, but of nuclear energy that is an effect that happens in the nuclei. So today, what we do is uh, go and uh, cover the topic of uh, how it is that we are living in a nuclear uh, world and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so if you go to our website, uh, you'll find that uh, we have a chapter in the lecture notes that uh, you're expected uh, to read, of course, uh, uh, on the nuclear world. And that describes really what followed uh, the first events of uh, the <clears throat> uh, uh, of the first reactor and the use of uh, nuclear energy, unfortunately, in a destructive uh, way. Uh, um, the file is quite large, so it's uh, loading uh, right here. And uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that we live in a nuclear world has been best described uh, by Albert Einstein. First, it has great promises in that we are now harnessing one very important part of nature, the nuclear force, but uh, uh, unfortunately also if it's used in uh, a stupid way or a fearful way or a greedy way, according to Albert Einstein, uh, then of course it can uh, cause great harm to the world. It can in fact end our technological civilization uh, in general. Uh, another quote by Albert Einstein, quote, I know not, with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV would be fought with sticks and stones. And that's uh, some kind of a, 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 a food for thought uh, right here. Uh, once uh, the uh, energy of nuclear uh, devices was, was released, uh, the humanity understood the, the great potential both for destruction and for well-being of humanity in the use of nuclear energy. So it uh, uh, it it sent uh, it uh, it uh, changed its emphasis from the use of nuclear energy in war and sublimating it to uh, a new state of knowledge, where basically we can quote uh, the Bible there, Isaiah, uh, turning their swords into plowshares, uh, and uh, thinking about peaceful applications uh, for uh, nuclear. Uh, energy in that case, and uh, trying to also contain the possible yet improbable use of nuclear weapons through different treaties and international agreements that we'll try to review uh, very quickly. The accumulated knowledge of nuclear energy is uh, following the uh, proverbial genie that, uh, or the Aladdin uh, genie uh, uh, <coughs> story, where the genie is out of the uh, lamp and it cannot be put back in again. So we better use it for nuclear uh, energy, uh, for nuclear, safe nuclear application. Uh, in January 1946, the uh, first General Assembly of the United Nations uh, created the first international body that uh, 
controls, uh, not control, but uh, 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 has participants that uh, agree uh, for the abolition of nuclear weapons and uh, in the form of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, it provides uh, uh, a, test, uh, uh, a way of testing the, uh, uh, that nations of the world are participating and uh, are uh, committed to the, uh, what's called the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Uh, as we'll review it later, the non-proliferation treaty commits the nuclear power states to eventually abolish nuclear weapons, which didn't unfortunately happen. Uh, and uh, for the other signatories to the treaty uh, to benefit from nuclear energy with the help of the nuclear power states, provided they do not develop nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, however, uh, uh, following the uh, uh, use of nuclear weapons in the Trinity test in the United States, uh, this is a picture of the sequence of the uh, explosions in the Trinity test uh, at Alamogordo. You could see the fireball. I've showed you that picture here uh, before. And then the formation of the mushroom up in uh, to uh, the sky. Uh, uh, that was followed by further testing uh, by the nuclear uh, weapons states, particularly the United States and was followed even by the development of much, much more uh, powerful weapons in the, uh, uh, in the case of the hydrogen uh, weapons that uh, increase the amount of uh, material uh, equivalent of uh, explosive TNT, trinitrotoluene explosive from the 20 kilotons or thousands of tons of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, to the level of the megaton. So it is not even a doubling, uh, it's a step it, that increases the power release from nuclear explosives to, uh, by a thousand fold. Thousand uh, a megaton would be millions of tons. This is the only picture, a uh, color picture available of the uh, Trinity test. Uh, uh, it shows the formation of the mushroom uh, in general. Uh, the process of nuclear explosion was tested in the atmosphere uh, in the United States in uh, the area of Nevada. And uh, it became a, some kind of uh, 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 an object of interest to all Americans. So you could see here a group of people from with their cars and pickups on a hill by Las Vegas uh, that can oversee the site, testing site in the Nevada desert, so they are standing there watching actually an actual nuclear explosion in the testing site. Uh, 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 and uh, even here, a mother and her son watching an actual test up in the atmosphere from their home in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. Uh, the whole process uh, was some kind of uh, attracted the curiosity uh, of uh, people in general. Uh, it was a romantic kind of a process. So you could see here, uh, uh, Miss uh, 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 Nuclear, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that lady playing, uh, young lady playing, uh, uh, dancing actually ballet with a nuclear explosion up in, tested in the atmosphere. And uh, another lady here showing a mushroom uh, cotton ball uh, uh, with a nuclear test there in the background while the test was being conducted in the atmosphere, as I said, it was visible from uh, uh, Las Vegas in Nevada. Uh, the, so that was uh, Atomic Bomb Ballet, and that lady was named uh, Miss Lee Merlin, Miss Atomic Bomb uh, in the Nevada desert. So it was some kind of a, uh, a curiosity and people uh, were interested in it, but primarily the military. The military in the United States was worried about a repetition of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and uh, the United States Navy worried about a bomb being exploded in a harbor like Pearl Harbor in that case and uh, being used against a naval fleet. So uh, they uh, started testing nuclear weapons. You could see here uh, ships uh, uh, that were really taken as well. They were mothballed or uh, uh, decommissioned ships from the Second World War and they exploded a nuclear device here uh, underwater. 
and you could see here the testing. Uh, this was designated as a crossroad uh, Baker test, and uh, it used a fleet of 96 decommissioned naval vessels. You could see their silhouette here uh, with the uh, 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 basically at uh, the Marshall Islands and uh, at an atoll. Uh, I'll describe what's an atoll to you in a moment. Uh, where that's named Bikini. And uh, uh, the name Bikini was taken by a French uh, designer of swimsuits and it became the name of that swimsuit design for uh, uh, ladies in general. Uh, the test was uh, undergone underwater. So you could see it created uh, a big uh, stem uh, when the fireball started rising from the water there. It had an energy release of 21 kiloton, and it was a fission uh, device. You could see the silhouettes again of all the ships, the 96 ships uh, gathered there, and you could see the extent of the fireball. This is uh, the shockwave uh, condensing uh, uh, water uh, around it, and uh, it was tested in an atoll. So what is an atoll? You could see here that island in the form of uh, it's really coral reef, uh, forming an island with an enclosed lagoon inside it. And that's a very suitable situation for the fishermen in the Bikini, uh, uh, in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, in that uh, the, uh, the atoll itself protects the inside lagoon from the high winds and waves of the Pacific so they can uh, keep their fleet, uh, fishing fleets on the inside and be protected uh, by from the waves. Uh, you could see the silhouettes again of the ships that were uh, exploded there and you could see the how the stem even raised up from the water. Look here, this little steps, uh, a whole ship raised out of the water uh, in the vicinity of the shock wave. And that was a, only a 21 kiloton uh, test of a weapon. Uh, this is a sequence of the events as I suggested, the test was conducted uh, underwater, uh, when the explosion first happens, you find that the, the fireballs uh, starts expanding out of uh, the, uh, the ocean bottom in the water. Uh, then it uh, grows up in the sky. It carried a whole ship there, as you could see in its vicinity, and then fell down back again. As it fell down, uh, this is more detail of that picture here. Uh, you could see that a wall of water uh, would fall on those decommissioned uh, ships. The idea was whether uh, a fleet of, uh, uh, in a harbor can be affected by uh, such an explosion and how it would affect it uh, in general. Uh, the water column that we could see here was hollow uh, in the center and uh, it had about 600 meters in width and it lifted 2 million tons of water. Uh, and that water, of course, doesn't stay up. It fell down back again. So it created a surge 274 meters in height. And the tsunami, in fact, 5 meters in height as it reached the Bikini uh, Atoll uh, 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 shores. Uh, they uh, tested uh, on the ships uh, different animals to test the effects of radiation on animals and on humans. Uh, these are goats shown in the atomic testing that followed in, on ships. Uh, I'll show you more detail of uh, those ships here uh, that were uh, decommissioned. Uh, this is uh, what happens to a uh, in that type of testing and the program. It was not just a single test. I followed it by many, many different tests. And uh, this is the an aircraft carrier. Uh, aircraft carriers have a deck that's made out of food uh, so that they can absorb the shock of the airplane uh, landing. And uh, uh, they exploded the, a device called the Gilda. They gave them funny names, uh, 150 meters above the deck. And you could see it's total devastation of uh, the uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, another aircraft carrier, this one survived sinking, but you could see the destruction. Uh, these are a recent, more recent, uh, photographs uh, uh, that uh, have become available. Another uh, uh, Sarat, uh, 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 decommissioned uh, aircraft carrier, the Saratoga, 
did not take the explosion and you could see it sank after eight uh, hours. Other ships were used in that case, for instance, the, uh, a battleship uh, a cruiser, maybe uh, the Pennsylvania was used in that type of a testing. Uh, some uh, ships from the uh, uh, Japanese Navy, the Sakawa was used in the testing. Uh, not very well known, the, the Nagato, which was uh, uh, the largest ship, uh, cruiser ship ever built was used also uh, in the testing, that's a Nagato. And uh, <clears throat> even a, uh, a German uh, cruiser was used in the testing. That one was too close to the explosion, so it sank. And now uh, in the lagoon itself, it is a, uh, an, a, a spot where uh, 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 scuba diving like to go there because it became now a colony for ship uh, for fish to grow in it. There were attempts at uh, uh, using uh, water, say, from uh, uh, firefighting uh, uh, tugboats uh, to clean up the surface of the ship from the radiation that came from the explosion. That is, uh, this is water jets uh, being used on the United States ships in New York. Uh, and you could see that uh, there has been destruction of the structure, the radar and the gun uh, uh, parts. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it turns out that uh, uh, basically the destruction can be uh, really uh, uh, substantial if uh, you explode a nuclear device in a harbor. Uh, the testing did not stop uh, 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 in uh, affecting ships in a harbor. You could see here, mannequins were used to see how an explosion would affect human beings. And uh, the uh, soldiers <clears throat> uh, were trained to uh, get uh, uh, first hide in a, maybe a trench uh, while the explosion is occurring, but then move into the area where the explosion has occurred. And that exposed them to unnecessary levels of radiation uh, unfortunately, they didn't know about it at the time. So they use mannequins and actual group uh, and actual uh, <clears throat> uh, soldiers. Uh, these are uh, uh, Air Force people. They were asked to uh, protect their eyesight from the ultraviolet, from the radiation, uh, from the explosion, uh, just to get accustomed to it. These are also uh, uh, Navy, uh, naval uh, uh, personnel uh, using ski goggles to protect from the ultraviolet radiation. You could see here that uh, troops were trained to watch the explosions, not only to watch the explosion from trenches, but then to later on move into the area where the explosion has occurred. Uh, what is not, uh, con was not considered there is that it is not just the X-rays that come out from the red or the light pulse that comes out from the explosion, but also neutrons and gamma rays, so all this personnel were exposed unnecessarily uh, to levels of radiation that would have affected their health later in their life. Uh, those soldiers also who were asked to go uh, into the area where the explosion has occurred, uh, definitely have been exposed to uh, unnecessary levels of radiation that would have affected their well-being. Uh, explosions also happened in the upper Atmosphere. You could see here that the mushroom takes a different form. The higher up in the atmosphere uh, you carry out the explosion, but it creates something that is called an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, the X rays and gamma rays from the explosion uh, act almost like lightning, but uh, at a much higher level uh, in the voltage from lightning and can destroy any electronic devices uh, below on the surface. So uh, car uh, engines would not start, the TVs will stop working, any electronic device would be affected uh, by the surge in the voltage. Uh, no circuit breaker can help in that case. So a single device exploded over the central United States can turn back the United States into uh, the stone age in that we lose all our electronics. And the same, I think there was a movie by Tom Cruise about uh, what would happen, say, if aliens would explode uh, one of those devices over the continental United States. Uh, if you explode the weapon up uh, in the higher uh, atmosphere, 
uh, you could see that a fireball is formed uh, from the device uh, components, but no dust is uh, pumped up into the atmosphere. In fact, the pictures look some kind of artistic uh, when it's exploded up in the atmosphere. So this is a high altitude test fireball. Uh, and as I suggested, the uh, X-rays and gamma rays, the electrons produced uh, can generate the equivalent of a lightning uh, on a grand scale. Uh, it is named the electromagnetic pulse. One of those tests uh, uh, generated, in fact, over Hawaii, uh, the island of Hawaii, the equivalent of an aurora borealis or northern uh, lights and uh, uh, damaged some street lights and some electronics uh, thousands of miles away. Uh, these are Air Force personnel, as I suggested, uh, asked to uh, uh, just uh, cover their heads and uh, with uh, nuclear testing of all those decommissioned airplanes being carried above their heads. As I suggested, uh, they were uh, exposed to unnecessary levels of radiation. Uh, this is even a testing of uh, a small group of five uh, people there uh, with a device exploded up right above their head. And uh, 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 you know, the first thing they see is, of course, light. Uh, light moves from the device uh, that is exploded above their head uh, at the speed of light. So they see a light pulse. But then it is followed by a shock wave. The air is heated. Uh, as it's heated, it expands as a piston. And that shock wave now propagates at the speed of sound. So after they see the light, uh, they are hit by a shock wave. And uh, this is the origin of the terminology ground zero. Uh, they are joking there, a ground zero population. The shock wave was uh, uh, a two kiloton now, not the uh, 20 kiloton. The weapons have been miniaturized, if you want to call it. Uh, an airburst uh, 10,000 feet up above their, uh, their, uh, their head. Uh, what is not thought about, of course, is that they're not just being exposed to light and a shock wave, but also X-rays and gamma rays and neutrons uh, that was not known. Uh, uh, artillery shells were developed in the range of that two kiloton level and were tested. You could see the size of that uh, uh, artillery shell from cannons in a uh, uh, testing the uh, the it's called the Grable event. You could see a few miles away uh, the shell can explode a nuclear device, and uh, uh, the yield in that case was at the same level as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 15 to 20 uh, kiloton. And uh, <clears throat> uh, testing also tested uh, the effect of nuclear weapons on different. Uh, installations. Uh, this is uh, a house, for instance, uh, one mile from a test explosion on that side of the house. You could see the first effect uh, is the light hitting the house, but then come the x-rays. They both are electromagnetic radiation, so they move at the speed of light. The heating from the x-rays ignites the paint and the surface on uh, the face facing uh, of the house facing the explosion. But then comes the shock wave. The shock wave, as I said, is almost like a piston of expanding air. And uh, after the, the fire would have uh, uh, affected the face of the house, you could see that the house now is subjected to uh, some compression. Uh, uh, it flies really apart. But then uh, uh, the shock wave is formed by a compression in the front and then followed by a rarefaction. So the house is pushed to the right under compression and then pulled to the left under tension. And in that case, uh, you could see the, uh, the part here coming back. Uh, the whole thing disintegrates, total disintegration of a house at one mile. And of course, uh, the x-rays would have set up the whole thing also on fire. So the devastation uh, is tremendously large. This is what happens to a house one mile away from uh, the upshot not whole uh, uh, testing that uh, was conducted uh, in general in 1943. Uh, as I suggested, the shock wave uh, causes a compression. So if you have, uh, they actually planted those trees to see their effects on 
uh, trees in the forest, you could see the trees uh, being pushed to the right, uh, the compression wave, uh, part of the shock wave, then pulled to the left back again by the tension part of the shock wave. If you have a little dog or a person here, you would be pushed to the right, flying out, and then pulled back uh, in the opposite uh, uh, direction. And of course, it set it on on fire. Uh, testing was done on the effects on radar installations. This is a radar on a ship here, and you could see uh, the total destruction that can happen to the radar uh, 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 the, uh, unit. <clears throat> uh, uh, this was all done with, uh, at the time with uh, fission devices. So the fission devices produce energy in the range of the 10 to 20 kiloton similar to the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki devices. Uh, 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 you can increase uh, the yield that uh, uh, you get from nuclear fission devices by what's called spiking them with fusion material. And uh, fusion uh, is a process other than fission. We'll study that as we go along, uh, where the nuclei are fused together rather than fission and energy in that case is released. And that's a primary source of energy in our universe, like the reaction that happens in the stars and in our sun in particular to uh, our fusion reaction. So came a scientist, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Edward Teller, uh, and uh, he was uh, on the Los Alamos Manhattan project and suggested that fusion uh, should be uh, tried as a source of uh, generating uh, nuclear devices. Robert Oppenheimer came up, uh, uh, objected to it. He suggested that by uh, spiking the fission devices with fusion material, particularly deuterium and tritium, as we'll see in a moment, uh, deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, tritium is an isotope of hydrogen that can be produced from uh, in the interaction of neutrons with uh, the lithium isotope. Another use of lithium other than lithium ion batteries that we use today, uh, he suggested that uh, we can reach 100 kiloton of energy release and objected to the idea of Edward Teller to uh, generate uh, 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 energy from fusion that can reach uh, per unit of mass uh, much higher energies than uh, fission. Uh, a clash happened between the two personalities, Robert Oppenheimer and Edward Teller. Uh, Edward Teller went to the United States Air Force uh, and uh, uh, the United States Air Force developed, especially for him, what is now today is the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory to develop uh, a fusion uh, as a way of uh, releasing nuclear energy. The argument uh, that was won was that uh, you cannot stop the competitor in that case uh, at the time, like today, as what was now the, uh, what was then the Soviet Union from developing those types of weapon. They named the project the Super uh, Project. Uh, that is the code name, uh, like the Manhattan Project was the code name for the fission uh, devices in general. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, uh, they uh, could not really uh, figure out how to generate the very high temperatures that occur in the stars. Uh, uh, very easily, uh, uh, and the idea came up to use a fission weapon uh, to heat up uh, the plasma, uh, in that case, so deuterium and tritium, isotopes of hydrogen, hence they were called hydrogen weapons, uh, to the level where they can fuse uh, together. Uh, so, in fact, uh, they uh, uh, had to simulate it, uh, and uh, the invention of computers, as we know today, uh, was uh, developed uh, just to simulate the process before they can test it uh, on an actual uh, device. And that project uh, was initiated here at the University of Illinois, if, uh, and uh, the computer was named the ILIAC-1, and uh, uh, some interesting aspect uh, uh, in computer science is that they used uh, relays, and here in the summer in Illinois, we have lots of uh, cone borer moths, uh, bugs and a job for some uh, people there on the computer was to debug the computer, getting the bugs actually out of the relays of the computer. 
the Iliad computer became the basis of the HAL uh, computer that was uh, uh, used by uh, uh, on the movie uh, Space Odyssey 2010 and 2000 uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, they had uh, trouble uh, trying figuring out how to heat the plasma uh, to generate uh, fusion in general. Uh, the effort continued in simulation on computers and three ideas came out. Uh, one, uh, due to Edward Teller himself, uh, designated as the womb uh, to uh, ignite a fusion reaction. Uh, another idea came in by a great mathematician, Stanislav Ulam. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, A History of a Mathematician. You can find it in the undergraduate library. Uh, he called it a spittoon. And uh, an idea due to uh, Stanislav uh, uh, Gamow, another scientist, uh, that describes it as squeezing the cat's tail. Uh, it turned out that the combination of the three ideas was the way that the scientists were able to ignite a fusion reaction using a fission reaction. Uh, so they used uh, what uh, is called the whole round uh, effect, and uh, we already looked at that table in the previous chapter, and uh, the reaction that uh, had to occur, uh, we'll uh, describe how to uh, derive those reactions. These are nuclear reaction now is to use the lithium-6 isotope and the lithium-7 isotope when you irradiate it with neutrons from a fission reaction you can produce an isotope tritium uh, and uh, helium-4 is produced and energy is released. So we'll balance that equation later uh, on. Uh, but in the end, uh, they combined the three processes and uh, in a book by Gamow, he gives us an idea about uh, what they uh, did together. Why am I showing this? Because uh, the process itself is still being kept uh, as a secret and the uh, configuration is named the Ulam Teller configuration. Uh, you notice here in that uh, diagram or a picture in the book, a book by Gamow, I think he names it the curve. Uh, the book is, yeah, uh, the curve of binding energy. Gamow is showing himself here, uh, squeezing the tail of a cat. Uh, Mr. Edward Teller is shown with a pendant uh, uh, called a uh, it has uh, a name in the American uh, Southwest. I think it let, that's uh, how the pendant looks like. It's a Naha, uh, Nahavo uh, necklace as a solution to generating uh, the thermonuclear or fusion reaction. And Stanislav Ulam himself, uh, who uh, uh, spitting into a spittoon, you could see that in the uh, cowboy movies, uh, they get a big chunk of tobacco, they chew it, and then they spit it out in the saloon into that spittoon. Above the three gentlemen there, you could see uh, here the picture of uh, uh, Robert Offerheimer with a halo around his head acting as an angel. Uh, and on the other side here, uh, uh, that was Joseph Stalin. Uh, because at the time, uh, after the fission reactions were uh, used in uh, fission weapons, uh, the Russians continued doing research and they exploded their first fission uh, weapons and Edward Teller argument won over the peaceful argument of Robert Oppenheimer that uh, thermonuclear weapons had to be developed because the Russians uh, will develop them uh, otherwise. Uh, initially, they tried the configuration by Mr. Edward Teller uh, in uh, exploding a fission device in the uh, uh, focus of a uh, 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 of uh, 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 a geometry designated as an ellipsoid of revolution, where you have two foci, and uh, the light generated in one focus reflects into uh, the other focus. The simulations on the Iliac computer here at the University of Illinois suggested that is not good enough to ignite a thermonuclear uh, device. So came in uh, at, uh, uh, Stanislav Ulam with his idea of a spittoon and came in Mr. Gamow with his idea of squeezing the uh, uh, tail of the cat's tail. And uh, they combined the three uh, methods uh, basically uh, uh, to try to generate that uh, fusion reaction from 
burning a fission reaction. This is the conceptualization of putting the three ideas together. Uh, this is by a gentleman named Weinberg, and this is my own drawing here. <laughs> Uh, so you use an ellipsoid of revolution. You could see the focus here. So this is the idea uh, of Edward Teller. At the focus, you explode the fission device. Uh, and uh, as you explode the fission device, neutrons and X-rays and gamma rays are generated. And if you generate, uh, if you get the correct geometry, uh, you'll find that it concentrates on the other side, on the other focus. There you ignite now from the x-rays of the uh, uh, fission device, some deuterium and tritium shown right here. You must have a shield between the two. And this is the uh, geometry that you would uh, find in the Museum of Science and Technology, uh, a trip by you to Chicago uh, and uh, go there and uh, 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 try to visit the, the, the display that's called the Whispering Gallery. So if you stand here in that gallery and whisper, uh, uh, a person on the other side at the focus there uh, would hear you. <laughs> and uh, uh, because of uh, the sound, the waves reflecting off the wall from one focus to another. Having ignited the deuterium and tritium, you'll find that now the neutrons from the fission device interact with a long cylinder that contains lithium deuteride. Initially, they used lithium-6 deuteride, but I, I show you later in the uh, notes that they didn't need to use lithium-6 deuteride, just the isotope lithium-6 of lithium. They could have used just plain lithium. Nevertheless, the neutrons interact with the lithium according to the two equations that I have shown earlier. A tritium is produced, and then the shock wave uh, uh, generate a whole realm or what's called the black body radiator that uh, generates a huge pressure from the radiation itself that uh, uh, now compresses the deuterium plus the tritium created from the lithium-6 and uh, causes, causes uh, the deuterium and tritium to fuse uh, together. So it is an amplifier in that case where you use fission uh, as the uh, uh, first stage of the amplifier, uh, then uh, deuterium and tritium uh, fuse together, they produce high energy neutrons, as we'll uh, see in the next chapter. Uh, these high energy neutrons have uh, an energy of 14 million electron volt, and uh, they can fission the casing on the outside here. That whole casing would be made out of uranium 238, not necessarily uranium 235. So, as a multi stage amplifier, you start from fission, then you get fusion, generates more neutrons, and you can get fission back again. You can start here with a small device which uh, generates only maybe the 10 kilotons or two kilotons, no more. But then with the fusion process, you can produce millions of ton of energy release uh, of uh, 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 TNT equivalent. One interesting aspect of it is that it's really a configuration that looks much like a cigarette. You're really igniting the tip of a cigarette so you can make that cylinder as large as you want and uh, the fusion reaction will still continue there. So in that case, you can generate tremendous amounts of energy. And this is called the Olam Teller configuration. Uh, uh, some people would add what's called the spark plug at the center here, a rod of plutonium 239 or uranium 235 that also would generate neutrons to uh, uh, transmute your lithium six into uh, the uh, uh, isotope tritium. And then the fusion reaction is not like four hydrogen uh, nuclei in our stars, the sun turning into helium. No, it's deuterium plus tritium producing a neutron plus an alpha particle. And that neutron carries a very large amount of energy to fission the casing. Uh, that configuration uh, has been uh, published. Uh, 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 so basically this, this is what uh, Stanislav Ulam in his book, you can find it at the library, Adventures of a Mathematician, quote, perhaps the change came with an idea I contributed. I thought of a way to modify the whole approach by injecting a repetition of certain arrangements. Unfortunately, the idea or set of ideas involved is still secret and cannot be described here. As you could see here, people have been trying to explain 
what the configuration is and uh, it's still uh, the details of it are really uh, still uh, uh, secret uh, in general. So what is the fusion reaction that happens in uh, a thermonuclear weapon or a hydrogen weapon is that the two isotopes of hydrogen, uh, 1D2 plus 1T3, uh, uh, hydrogen would have one proton, but if you have the isotope of deuterium that has an extra neutron, so it's 1D2, uh, the tritium has two extra neutrons, it's still hydrogen, Chemically, it has an atomic number of one and one, but uh, on Earth, uh, humans can generate that reaction that is the analog of four hydrogen atoms happening in our star, the sun, producing, oh, alpha, an alpha particle, but here we get an extra neutron, high energy neutron that can cause the fission of the uh, third stage in the explosion uh, itself. And uh, uh, the idea was tested initially with fusing deuterium with deuterium in a device here, a very large device that uh, had several atomic uh, devices in the center, but contains uh, liquid deuterium, not the DT reaction, but we'll call it later the DD reaction, deuterium plus deuterium. And you could see that vessel was very large, also tested in the Marshall Islands. Uh, notice that gentleman sitting here uh, to give you an idea about the size of the device. These are tubes uh, that were one mile in length to an island so that they can measure the results of the explosion. You could see here uh, a description that looks very much like the Ulam teller configuration, a fission device here in a spherical shape with a shield with that spark plug and the fusion uh, material uh, uh, shielded by that shield in the configuration of the uh, uh, whispering uh, gallery. Uh, the name of the device was called the Mike device. It was 22 feet in length, five feet in diameter. And uh, 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 basically it was uh, a great success. Uh, you could see here that device, uh, a fusion device now exploding. And it was done in one of the uh, uh, atolls, as I suggested, the atoll lake is basically a coral reef island formed by coral uh, glowing with a lagoon in the center. So they exploded it on a barge inside on the inside of the lagoon. Uh, that Mike uh, thermonuclear test happened in 1952 and look at the yield that it yielded. It was 10.4 million tons or megaton of TNT at uh, what is called the Anyway Talk Atoll. Uh, so it was 500 times the yield from the Hiroshima device. And that was in 1952. It generated a mushroom cloud that reached 100,000 feet. So it basically it uh, rotated around the whole uh, Earth uh, in that case. So here is uh, what we are living under today. It's not just uh, uh, the possible tremendous yield uh, from the fission devices in the kiloton but we are living under the threat of the uh, uh, fission uh, fusion or thermonuclear devices that can produce energy in the range of the millions of tons of uh, T and uh, TNT. Uh, basically, uh, it yielded, as I said, 10.4 million tons of TNT equivalent or megatons of T uh, uh, and T uh, equivalent. Uh, they, at the, when the explosion occurred, they were worried about uh, igniting the atmosphere from the energy release and the temperatures reached uh, in the plasma of deuterium and tritium. They worried about the nitrogen in the atmosphere. You know that we are breathing 70% uh, nitrogen, 15% oxygen in the air we breathe. They worried about the, ni and, uh, the uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere fusing itself together again in a reaction that would produce magnesium and alpha particles and that the earth would turn into a star. Well, it didn't happen uh, actually because here we are uh, alive here. Uh, the first device used uh, deuterium, uh, deuterium plus deuterium as a fusion reaction. Uh, so they used basically a cryogenic liquid. So it was uh, not portable, you needed really a, a, a a cryogenic uh, liquefying station. So the Russians uh, exploded the device where they used uh, a powder. And that powder was lithium 
uh, due to riot. So the United States imitated it uh, in what's called the Bravo test, uh, where lithium deuteride is uh, a, like lithium hydride. If you say, instead of deuteride, you say hyd uh, hydride uh, is a powder. So in that case, it becomes a, a deliverable device that you can put on an airplane or a missile. And that uh, uh, is a device that was built. In fact, there is a picture of it here. Uh, was, uh, gives you an idea about the size of it. It was exploded on a barge again uh, in one of the atolls in the Marshall Islands. And internally, they show that Ulam Teller configuration here, the, uh, the uh, fission device uh, uh, being imploded. So they used plutonium. Uh, and then here is the uh, thermonuclear charge with the shield and the spark plug at the center. And 80% uh, uh, of the yield uh, came out from the casing here that was made out of uranium-238, because in that case, the fast neutrons from the fusion reaction can fission that uranium-238. And 80% uh, of the yield would come from the fissioning of that uranium-238. So I repeat again, that was a multi-stage multi amplifier, fission, fusion, fission again. Uh, the Russians uh, competed with the United States and uh, generated a device that yielded uh, 50 mil 65, actually, 65 million tons of TNT. Uh, they reduced it from a size design size of 100 uh, megatons of uh, TNT uh, because it would have uh, 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 downed the plane or the air, the Tupolev uh, uh, plane that uh, dropped it and would have reached the shockwave all the way uh, to Moscow. Uh, so that was the ev largest ever device ever exploded. Uh, this is the Bravo test uh, picture. You could see the device here she, uh, on a barge exploded in the atoll here, the bikini atoll in that case. Something happened, went wrong there, is that the meteorologists suggested that the winds would be blowing from east to west uh, in the Pacific that day. That's an open space of the Pacific uh, Ocean so that the uh, product of the explosion that's called, they're named as a fallout, uh, would not affect population centers. Uh, unfortunately, the weather uh, cheated them and uh, it changes direction from west to east and affected two islands, one atoll and one island uh, uh, that were inhabited in that area. The fallout covered an area of 5,000 square uh, miles, so it was a, a big problem. Uh, not only uh, did the weather uh, condition change, but uh, they designed the device to uh, use lithium-6 uh, deuteride. They didn't need to do it. Uh, the yield was double the yield that was calculated from the explosion. They had a, an observation post there uh, to uh, observe the the, the explosion itself in the bikini at all, uh, the yield uh, and the, uh, affected the observers. They had to be evacuated by helicopters uh, wearing uh, like uh, bed sheets above their heads to protect from the fallout from the radiation. Uh, this is again the bikini at all the, uh, with a barge that was exploded in center. Today, uh, the bikini at all is part of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Uh, it is a tourist place to visit. If you have a chance, I haven't uh, that you can visit. Uh, the, ex uh, the excess yield that uh, happened, uh, unexpected excess yield, uh, affected the crews of an observation uh, ship, the USS Curtis. Uh, it was weaponing, uh, monitoring the test, and uh, this is uh, newly released information. They were affected by the testing. Uh, and uh, uh, another effect of the testing was the, uh, that a ship uh, uh, catching basically tuna in the Pacific, uh, it's named Lucky Dragon, now kept here uh, as a museum piece uh, in uh, Japan. Uh, uh, the sailors on the ship found uh, snow falling on their ship in the middle of the Pacific. They were astonished, what is that? Uh, it was a fallout, one of the crew members got a large dose of radiation, he died. The tuna was sent to 
the markets in Tokyo and then withdrawn quickly when they discover it has radiation in it. Uh, as a result of the uh, excess uh, yield from the test, uh, the inhabitants of those two islands that I have shown you there were evacuated uh, basically and uh, uh, they were uh, promised uh, better conditions on different other islands, but that was not the uh, case uh, in that case. Uh, 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 in that case, they were relocated and returned back, then relocated again, then returned back. Uh, and uh, uh, there are still some kind of problems with the United States government concerning compensation and uh, the uh, 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 renovation of the ground that was uh, damaged in the test. Uh, I give here an uh, tentative explanation uh, of the tripled yield of the Bravo test, why it is so. Uh, the problem was that at the time where the test, the, uh, these tests were conducted, uh, the reaction rate that was under consideration is the reaction rate. Uh, this reaction rate here, uh, this is what we call the cross section, we'll study it later, uh, of the reaction rate of lithium 6, the isotope lithium 6, with the uh, uh, deuterium. Uh, in fact, uh, what they ignored is that there is uh, another reaction that happens with the isotope lithium-7, and they did not take that into account that produces more neutrons first, and second produces more tritium. So I give an explanation on why is it that it was a tri triple test here, and uh, we'll come back to those reactions uh, later, uh, later on. So we live in a world now where we cannot just uh, uh, produce kilotons of uh, uh, energy release from fission devices, we are talking about millions of tons of TNT released from a single device. Uh, the devices would be quite large in size initially. That is the MK17 device, 25 feet in length, so you needed really specially large bombers to carry it for delivery. Right now, they have been miniaturized to be carried by cruise missiles. So this is a Tomahawk uh, cruise missile carrying uh, uh, what would be a W80 uh, named uh, uh, thermonuclear device. You could see here that uh, part is, would be the spherical uh, 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 fission uh, device and that would be the fusion part. Look at the size of that W80 device right here. It can be carried uh, by two uh, people. Uh, so that large size, the initial huge size there has been miniaturized to uh, something that be carried carryable by a cruise missile. In fact, the length is 31 inches, 80 centimeters, less, less than uh, one meter in uh, uh, size. So this is a thermonuclear device, and uh, I think it can generate up to uh, the uh, 100 kilotons of uh, energy release. So the W80 uh, 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 device, as I said, can be uh, carried by a cruise missile, a Tomahawk. And uh, you could see here the yield 5 to 170 kiloton. Why 170? 5 is if you simply use the uh, device as uh, uh, a plain uh, fission device. Uh, but if you add to, to it the tritium, uh, you can turn it into a thermonuclear device. You can, uh, as a general in the field, can tailor uh, the release of the energy to what he likes to have. Uh, the B53 is a device shown here, much larger in size. That is nine megatons uh, of uh, thermonuclear uh, power release. And... Uh, it's a picture from the United States Department of Energy. Uh, these devices are not really needed at all uh, in war or in peace, uh, particularly in war, obviously. Uh, these are meant to destroy whole metropolitan areas, like all the area of Chicago and Milwaukee and uh, all the area around it would be destroyed in that case. And that is uh, against the Con Geneva Conventions where you are not supposed to target uh, in war civilian populations. Uh, this uh, shows some detail on how those devices are built. Uh, there are lots of components that are used in building those devices. So it's a, 
uh, has to be uh, developed by a highly industrialized uh, nation or country. This is not something that non-national groups can develop in any way. Uh, even if they have the weapon, they cannot uh, get it to uh, explode. So it's a, a whole complex uh, uh, industrial complex that is used in uh, building, maintaining, and uh, uh, generating and these uh, devices. Uh, this is a configuration that was uh, shown by a, uh, a reporter in uh, the city of Madison, Wisconsin, where a magazine named The Progressive is published. And he did some research for one of his articles and showed more detail about that Edward Teller configuration. He shows here uh, the spherical part with the explosive lenses made out of the plutonium-239 core, a shell in that case, followed by a tamper with a shield where you have now the uh, lithium deuteride uh, powder uh, uh, followed by foam here, just plain uh, uh, foam. Uh, the, ex the fission device is exploded. Uh, the radiation fills up that foam. It compresses the thermonuclear charge here with a plus uh, a plug of plutonium or uranium-235 at the center. And uh, at the bottom, you would have uh, a little container that uh, injects tritium uh, uh, and deuterium into the core there uh, of the fission device if you want to control the yield from the reaction. So you get a fission here. The fission produces radiation that compresses the uh, fusion fuel uh, neutrons that uh, convert your lithium. As I said, it's a different use of lithium rather than actually competitive use of lithium other than lithium ion batteries. Uh, turns the lithium into tritium, then deuterium and tritium in lithium hydride or hydro uh, lithium hydride, in fact, or deuteride uh, can produce fusion neutrons. And then the casing itself uh, could be made out of uranium-235. Uh, uh, some people, uh, uh, lots of uh, controversy, not controversy, but uh, uh, people try to uh, think about the configuration of the Ed, uh, Ulam Teller configuration. This would be the fission device here, and uh, or the primary, as it's called, the secondary would be the fusion uh, with foam surrounding the lithium-6 uh, deuteride. Uh, the uh, gentleman who wrote that article was... Uh, I forgot his first name, but Moreland, uh, he wrote a book, The Secret That Exploded. Uh, it existed at the undergraduate library, and then uh, strangely, it disappeared. Some people uh, uh, appropriated it, and I don't know whether you can find it in the library. Uh, these are different configurations now of uh, uh, re-entry vehicles. Uh, some of the ICBMs, the terminology is something we need to remember. ICBM stands for intercontinental ballistic missile can carry 12 of these uh, devices uh, as, uh, uh, or even, uh, yeah, 12 is a maximum number I have seen, uh, distribute them from one nation uh, to another. Uh, in that case, the configuration is not exactly the Ulam Teller configuration. Uh, they give a shape in the shape of a peanut. And uh, in that peanut here, you would have a primary that contains plutonium, 239, uh, producing uh, the radiation, the X-rays that would compress another spherical shape in the other side of the peanut uh, of a thermonuclear weapon containing lithium deuteride, the fusion uh, fuel. Uh, and in that case, uh, since you would have 12 of these on a single ICBM uh, rocket, they call, it, they call them the multiple independent, independent re-entry vehicles, an acronym that I urge you to know. That device is incorrect because the plutonium part of the device uh, is going to be uh, higher density, heavier than the lithium uh, uh, part, which is uh, uh, lithium deuteride powder. So the whole thing would be unbalanced. So in that case, they show us uh, different configurations. Uh, that would be 300 kiloton of TNT, where the uh, fission device is in the front. That's a more uh, correct kind of a configuration because of the stability. Uh, and uh, the fusion device, again, would be in the peanut in the back of the device. 
so that's another one here with the fission part in the front and the fusion uh, part in uh, the back. Now you want, that's a, would produce, that's a W88 uh, uh, device uh, that would produce half a megaton or 500 kiloton of uh, energy, supposedly. These are actual pictures of those devices and they give us an idea about the actual configuration. The fission would be on that side, the fusion would be on that side. And uh, here are configurations again of these weapons uh, that would be five to 170 kiloton. Again, they, uh, you can uh, tune uh, the yield by tuning the amount of tritium you have in your device. Lots of components. This is even uh, what's called the demolition munitions, small uh, uh, nuclear device that can be used to demolish bridges or uh, small fortification. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, we live in a world where, where we are under the threat uh, of uh, nuclear annihilation. They call it the MAD concept, mutual assured destruction. Uh, the nuclear power states uh, uh, target the United States and the United States targets the other nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, from the Federation of American Scientists, uh, who are a group of uh, scientists who oppose nuclear, uh, of course, uh, armaments, uh, they uh, give us an idea about the detail of the Minuteman 3. Uh, that's a land-based uh, intercontinental ballistic uh, missile uh, made uh, or uh, manufactured by the Boeing uh, company. Uh, they suggest that uh, it has a range of 6,000 miles or five or 5,200 nautical miles. So you can launch it from the United States. It goes over the North Pole and hits the uh, Russian uh, mainland or unfortunately the Chinese mainland because uh, these are the three main nuclear power states uh, threatening uh, each other. It can reach a speed of 15,000 miles per hour and uh, that would be Mac 23. So it's already a supersonic uh, type of a device. It, uh, Mac is, uh, designates the speed of sound. So Mac 23 means that it moves, it's moving at 23 times the speed uh, of sound. And, uh, 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 and uh, uh, you'll find that it's very cheap. It's $7 million. A T-72 tank could cost maybe $1 million. So it's seven times the price of uh, a tank. And uh, uh, in that case, it can cause huge uh, destruction. Uh, the idea of uh, that speed of it's being a supersonic speed, 23, Mach 23, uh, can be checked here. So I do a small calculation. Uh, I take the radius of the Earth as 4,000 miles. So the circumference of the Earth is twice pi r, so that's 25,000 miles. If uh, you have an ICBM and you want to reach uh, half the circumference of the Earth, so the distance that it traveled would be the circumference divided into two, that's 12,566 miles. And uh, this is uh, double the range uh, that is uh, reported for those ICBMs, 6,000 miles. Uh, they report that the time that it takes an ICBM to travel from the continental United States to a target, say, in the Soviet Union is half an hour. So to cover that distance D, you can say that the speed now is uh, uh, the D, the distance 6,000 to 12,000 miles divided into the 0.5 hours. So it has to go at 12,000 to 25,000 uh, miles per hour. So if you take the average speed uh, from the time of launch to the time where it hits the target as a 12,000 plus 25,000 averaged, uh, you find that the average speed is 18,566 miles per hour. Uh, the uh, speed of sound at STP, standard uh, uh, temperature and level, uh, if you uh, at 15 degrees Celsius is 350 meters per second, which we can transfer, uh, uh, convert into 765 miles per hour. The missile would be flying at 18,566 uh, miles per hour. So if you divide that by the speed uh, of sound, then you find that you get 24.4 M, Mach 24. So it is a supersonic. It's being supersonic. If you want to intercept it, you need also 
uh, a supersonic interceptor uh, uh, rocket, and that is very difficult. Uh, even though, even you, uh, if you use computers and you can uh, determine the uh, uh, the trajectory of the missile being launched, and you have to really follow it from the time of its launch, uh, it's very difficult to intercept uh, uh, a an object going at uh, 24 times the speed of sound, unless you have something that goes even higher uh, in speed. Uh, however, our calculation checks uh, the speed that is Mach 23 that is reported by the Boeing uh, 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 company. Uh, the, uh, uh, so here we are living in a world where uh, mutually assured destruction is uh, a balance. Uh, it's uh, a balance that can uh, lead to the end of our civilization. So nuclear war is a threat uh, an extinction kind of threat or a filter, like we mentioned in the preface of the lectures uh, to humanity at the same level as uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, gain of function research that generates viruses that can destroy all of humanity. We are suffering from that now. Uh, nuclear war becomes another possible uh, uh, extinction or a filter. Uh, to our technological civilization. So the whole extinction of the human race can come in from a stupid uh, nuclear uh, war. Uh, so that should be a no-no for humanity. Uh, in addition, as I said, that gain of function research, viruses, in addition to uh, our destroying our atmosphere through uh, global warming. And uh, these are things that we can control as humans, even though we cannot control, say, a, an asteroid or a comet hitting us like 64 million years ago that ended the realm of the uh, dinosaurs uh, in general. Uh, 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 following the United States uh, developing thermonuclear weapons, so we find ourselves in a, a nuclear arms race that is continuing until today. In fact, uh, it hasn't uh, uh, stopped whatsoever. Uh, the Russia caught up with the American effort, exploded its first fusion divide in Siberia in 1953. And uh, one of their uh, tests uh, yielded what uh, people suggest is 58 million megatons of TNT. And that was the largest uh, yield ever generated. As I suggested, ICBMs do not use a single uh, device. You could see here the MIRV devices, one, two, three, four, five here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the top of an ICBM. Uh, those uh, devices uh, uh, are uh, uh, what's called multiple independently released vehicles. Uh, each one of them is 300 to 475 kilotons, 10 times or 20 times the yield from the Hiroshima device, every one of uh, uh, them, and you can control uh, their yield. As they are uh, targeting a, a city or a military installation, uh, they are being impacted some kind of gyroscopic motion. So you'd have little rockets at the back of these re-entry vehicles that gives them uh, a rotation so that they get basically gyroscopic uh, uh, action. Uh, however, uh, 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 when they are launched, uh, decoys are also being launched to uh, 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 get uh, the uh, anti-ballistic weapons uh, uh, rockets that try to uh, intercept them uh, to fool them. So uh, it's almost impossible to, uh, uh, even though the military suggests that they can do it, uh, it's uh, very, very hard to intercept any of those missiles once launched. Uh, the uh, it, uh, development of thermonuclear weapons led to uh, an arms race. So. Uh, here, uh, the United States has the uh, nuclear weapons now, a megaton levels. Uh, the Russians have it, but uh, England, the UK should have it too. So here is uh, the British developing uh, a device that is 720 kiloton. They call it the Orange Herald concept. You could see here, they give us lots of detail about their device. It's a spherical device uh, with the uh, uh, igniters here or the initiators. Uh, on the surface, so it's an implosion device, and they added tritium to it, uh, basically to get it to yield 720 kiloton, and they give us lots of details 
about the construction of the device, you could see here, again, the spherical shape of the uh, primary or the fission device, and then here, uh, the detail of the thermonuclear part using lithium-6 deuteride. As I suggested, they don't need to use lithium-6, yet whole factories were built to produce that lithium-6. Uh, they didn't know that lithium would be just enough initially, uh, and they just imitated uh, each uh, other. Now, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 a UK design of what's called a stage thermonuclear device. Uh, and uh, so the British developed it, but then it didn't stop there. The British developed it, the French went ahead also and developed their own nuclear weapons and they tested it. Uh, this is a test uh, uh, conducted by the French on the island of Tahiti. Uh, so this is in the Southern Hemisphere now, in the South uh, Pacific. So the French, the British, the Russians, the Americans formed the nuclear club. And that nuclear club now becomes some kind of uh, 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 a, uh, an institution that everybody else wants to join it. So uh, the Indians uh, uh, developed their own nuclear devices. In that case, they used plutonium as their fission uh, uh, material and uh, they placed it on uh, missiles as you could see here this is a, a launch of a test uh, rocket uh, they call it the da danush missile well uh, uh, india developed it so well uh, pakistan must uh, now develop its own the pakistanis uh, adopted a different approach than the indians uh, instead of using plutonium 239 they used uh, uh, through enrichment uranium-235. Uh, it seems that uh, that has been also followed by uh, North Korea. And uh, the North Koreans uh, uh, are some kind of uh, 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 obsessed with showing that the, indeed they have a device that works. So you could see their pictures here of their device that, uh, uh, that they published showing a part that is not published in the American literature. And that part here is the condensers that uh, uh, provide the energy for the initiators or the uh, uh, that uh, start the fission uh, reaction that you could see here, the, they call it the physics uh, device. Uh, and uh, that to show that the, indeed they have a system that would uh, uh, be a uh, working workable system. They show here even uh, in a particle accelerator that would initiate the reaction by accelerating particles of deuteron and tritium. That's not shown also in the American literature. And the composition of the device itself uh, was shown maybe inadvertently or intentionally on the wall. That drawing here was magnified by many people on the internet. And this is what you see here. You could see now the physics device in the back here. You find the fission device and then you find the fusion part, the primary and the uh, secondary. Uh, so they have basically also a, a system that would deliver those weapons. So here we have uh, a world that has uh, basically a nuclear club. Uh, initially, uh, North Korea joined the non-proliferation treaty. It was promised uh, uh, if uh, it destroys uh, its uh, uh, reactors making some plutonium, uh, uh, by President uh, Clinton uh, to have uh, the United States supply them with a peaceful nuclear power plant for producing electricity. Uh, came in the next uh, president uh, and uh, uh, the Bush in that case also said, no, uh, we, I didn't promise that to them. So the United States reneged on its promise to North Korea. So the North Koreans withdrew from the non-proliferation treaty and now uh, they are developing their uh, own uh, devices uh, uh, in general. If you look at the, uh, uh, the physics component here, the physics part, uh, it is providing the, uh, from capacitors in that case, uh, the energy for the uh, uh, spark plugs, uh, not the spark plugs, but the initiators. So this would be the fission part and that would be uh, the fusion part. Their design still, uh, lacks uh, in that the fission part should be in the front rather than in the back to get their uh, reentry vehicle more stability. 
But nevertheless, it is a workable device that can at least single device can cause an electromagnetic pulse that can uh, uh, destroy all the electronics on a large area and turn the area into back to the Stone Age. Uh, they even have the deliver delivery vehicles. That's a rocket, the Wasong Mobile launch ICBMs. Uh, two or three years ago, that uh, a few years ago, the process uh, 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 reached uh, a level of uh, 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 it was alarming. Uh, with the leadership in the United States, of course, this is where the president of the United States would have a bunker uh, hiding from the effects of nuclear attacks. Look at the, this is called the blast wall. Uh, this is the shield area, very deep uh, underground into mountain ranges. This is the one where President John F. Kennedy uh, basically uh, on Peanut Island near uh, Riviera Beach in uh, Florida, uh, 10 minutes from Palm Beach. So the leadership would be hiding there uh, to conduct a nuclear war, but uh, civilians in the cities would be obliterated. A single fireball you could see here being tested on an army, uh, lots of vehicles from an army kind of uh, uh, formation. And you could see that the blast wave of a device built, uh, exploded up in the air would generate a shock wave. The shock wave would reflect. You could see the reflection here. And as the two shock waves interact with each other, they generate a blast wave that would uh, propagate horizontally, destroying everything there uh, on the ground. And uh, this, uh, if you upload it, uh, if exploded up in the atmosphere, you generate a very strong electromagnetic pulse or a magnetic field that can destroy any, uh, any electronics around it. Nuclear testing in the atmosphere uh, has been uh, banned uh, because of the release of radioactivity that was observed from its effect. So uh, at some point, the United States uh, opted for underground uh, explosions. Uh, this is uh, at the Nevada test site, an explosion underground. You could see that uh, the explosion formed probably a cavity, then the cavity collapsed upon itself and uh, uh, to test new configuration, new compositions, new everything uh, for nuclear uh, weapons. At some point, humanity thought that, oh, we uh, could use uh, those nuclear explosives in peaceful programs. For instance, we can uh, uh, explode them in a row and uh, uh, generate a canal. So uh, as we know, the Panama Canal is not a sea level canal. Uh, the suggestion came out to dig a new canal uh, in Panama uh, that is sea level rather than having a system of locks and dams. Uh, there were ideas about creating harbors, and uh, uh, one interesting idea, uh, uh, as you suggested, the uh, harbors may be, uh, this is a, t a test conducted to, it's called the Sidan, a Sidan test, uh, and you could see the size of it, that's 100 kiloton of TNT in the Nevada desert, and uh, uh, if you look very carefully here, you can see some people observing, oh, here. Uh, cars and it gives you a huge uh, 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 crater uh, to create a harbor or uh, to create uh, canals. Another interesting application is what is now named, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing or uh, fracking of uh, petroleum. Uh, if you explode a nuclear device in a depleted uh, natural gas field or a petroleum uh, deposit, uh, you can uh, fracture the medium, uh, uh, increase the, uh, the, the radius of the well from which you are extracting the hydrocarbon. And uh, in that case, uh, you can also use it for leaching ores. Like if you have an ore of uh, uh, copper ore, you can uh, fracture the medium, in, uh, inject into it uh, <coughs> an acid that dissolves the leach, the material, and then pump it back to uh, the surface. This uh, came to be named the Plowshare Program uh, that uh, suggested the use of uh, peaceful nuclear explosions to stimulate the production of natural gas by fracturing the medium. And now 
It is done with chemical explosives and horizontal wells, and the, the name for it is uh, hydraulic fracturing or uh, fracking. But uh, the interesting uh, future application would be uh, to explode those nuclear weapons in a, a roll. In that case, you eject the material to the sides and you can dig a canal where ships uh, can go from say the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, that could become an interesting topic uh, in our future because uh, about 22 million years ago, the earth enjoyed a very mild uh, climate uh, uh, with the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean joined together. But uh, since then, the tectonic plates have moved and uh, separated the, the, the two regions of the Pacific and the Atlantic. And if we restore back again that 22 uh, uh, million years ago configuration, reconnecting the Atlantic to the Pacific, I have an article written on that topic. Uh, you can uh, uh, counter a, a possible runaway global warming effect, restore the Earth back to what it was 22 million years ago, a very mild uh, temperate uh, uh, climate. Uh, uh, but uh, that is in our uh, future uh, if we do not control the emissions of carbon dioxide and uh, methane. Uh, uh, so the plowshare program was suggested uh, India started testing nuclear weapons to apply these ideas. The United States said, uh oh, everybody will start using nuclear weapons for peaceful uses. Uh, so basically, uh, the research in the plowshare programs uh, was uh, uh, not funded anymore and well, it is not existing uh, today. Uh, uh, following the release of radiation from nuclear testing, uh, the world has what's called the comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, 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 all nations commit themselves not to have basically nuclear testing in the atmosphere and underground is uh, banned, except that there is some clandestine testing that has occurred uh, by South Africa and uh, Israel. Uh, South Africa has uh, uh, dismantled its nuclear program. Uh, the Israelis maintain more or less a an ambiguous uh, 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 an ambiguous kind of uh, uh, situation, uh, but uh, uh, it is some kind of uh, known that they have nuclear uh, devices. In that case, they adopted the the use of uh, plutonium devices in a reactor that France built them in the Nag Negev Desert, called the Dimona uh, reactor. Uh, the testing uh, clandestinely by South Africa and uh, at the time of the apartheid uh, regime uh, was detected by a satellite from the United States and by hydrophones uh, by the United States Navy at the bottom of the ocean. So the surveillance satellite is called the Vela satellite, that means sail in Albanian, uh, detected uh, a test in the South uh, Pacific of uh, a double kind of a hump of an electromagnetic uh, pulse. And uh, this uh, double hump is uh, uh, different than the, double, uh, the single hump that you get from a, a discharge of lightning. Uh, the reason is that when you explode the nuclear device, you get prompt gamma rays from the initial explosion, and then you get another emission of gamma rays from the fission product. So double hump means a nuclear explosion or as a single hump would have meant uh, a, uh, a situation where you have only uh, lightning. So uh, we know that uh, uh, these uh, uh, clandestine type of devices exist uh, uh, maybe uh, today, even though South Africa withdrew from that development of nuclear weapons process. At some point also Brazil, uh, had uh, started developing nuclear weapons, but their program was dismantled. Uh, the United States has adopted lately what is named as a counter-proliferation regime. It replaced the non-proliferation regime with the United States itself. Uh, uh, when a nation is suspected of having nuclear weapons, then 
uh, it is targeted for <laughs> regime uh, change. Uh, and uh, that led to the war, the first war and second wars with Iraq on the basis that uh, uh, it is uh, a nuclear program or weapons of mass destruction is being uh, removed. But uh, the fact is that those weapons were not there or chemical weapons uh, uh, in general. Uh, you'll find that uh, the Cold War uh, uh, persists today uh, and uh, the United States uh, uh, President Barack Obama and the Russian uh, at that time, Dmitry Medvedev, not uh, Putin, signed uh, what's called the START Nuclear Arms Disarmament Treaty. Uh, basically, the whole 19 months later, in November 2011, uh, uh, Mr. Medvedev upset about the missile defense system built, built by the United States in Europe. Uh, uh, basically, they uh, withdrew from uh, the treaty. So we are still under the uh, uh, threat of a nuclear war. And uh, that uh, was displayed uh, with uh, a clash with uh, North Korea, with a display of force here, the B-1B, bomber shown here, the B-2 Spirit, the stealth bomber, and the B-52s uh, gathered uh, at the Anderson uh, Air Force Base in Guam, uh, flown from the Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota as a display of force uh, uh, to uh, uh, warn uh, North Korea about the possible use of nuclear weapons against the United States. And uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, a, a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons uh, is available to the United States to, for delivery with the B-2 bomber and the B-52 and the B-1B uh, bomber. So that's uh, a mock, uh, 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 basically B-83 uh, warhead being dropped from a B-2 stealth uh, bomber. So uh, the threat is here still of uh, nuclear war. Many. Uh, the, uh, many uh, alternatives have been developed and then uh, decommissioned. That's a ground launch cruise missile. Uh, basically, it, it carried what's called what's called the W84 warhead has been dismantled. But uh, the Minutemen, which are un Minutemen three, uh, being lowered into its silo, is all over the United States in different locations and. Uh, uh, the more efficient, and that shows a launch of one of those ICBMs, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. I urge you to try to remember those names. I'll give it to you as an assignment. Uh, and uh, that carries a W62 warhead. This uh, uh, rocket is huge in size. Look at the size of that person uh, against the size of one of the uh, Minuteman missiles. Not only the Minutemen are ground-based ICBMs, but also uh, the fleet of nuclear submarines, the Trident, uh, carry also uh, ICBMs that can be launched uh, from uh, positions, uh, locations on the whole surface of the Earth that cannot be uh, detected. So this is shows as a submarine launch uh, cruise uh, missile from underwater. Some uh, devices like the Davy Crockett here uh, was only 20 tons of TNT that supposedly would have been used by uh, army uh, troops, uh, this has been uh, uh, decommissioned. It has no use because it will affect the troops by radiation uh, that are launching it uh, in general. So right now we have uh, uh, what is called the mutually assured destruction. Uh, our chapter is uh, the nuclear world that we are living in. Uh, we are living in a world with mutually assured destruction and it's uh, an unstable balance, uh, nuclear war can be uh, uh, started anytime uh, by mistake or by uh, maybe even b uh, brinkmanship, Some, uh, one uh, side showing that they are stronger than uh, the other. Uh, these are the different uh, devices that the United States uh, is known uh, to have the, from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, they have designations, the little boy of Hiroshima was 15, uh, megaton. Some devices are very small in yield, uh, but some devices can be also very large, uh, quite large in yield. The B-83, for instance, is uh, 1.2 ma million tons of TNT. Uh, so these are the characteristics of 
the United States Air Force nuclear warheads. Uh, the new Air Force uses either cruise missiles uh, or they use intercontinental ballistic missile warhead or strategic warheads. This would be carried on the bombers, uh, the B-1B and the others. So what's the situation in the world today? Uh, the probability of uh, joining the nuclear club is shown by that uh, interesting uh, uh, cartoon here. Uh, some uh, countries are accused of trying to develop nuclear weapons against their commitment for the uh, non-proliferation treaty. They show here the Iranians uh, being denied uh, uh, membership into the nuclear club. So the probability of joining the nuclear club is proportional to one over N, where N is the number of members of the club. So as N grows bigger, the probability of being able to join it is uh, uh, reduced. Uh, uh, basically, the members of the club deny uh, other people uh, uh, joining their own club. Uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT Treaty, has been signed by the nuclear power states, Russia, the United States, France, China, the UK. It has been signed by also other non, uh, uh, but it hasn't been signed by countries that possess nuclear weapons, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Uh, Pakistan is suspected to have 60 warhead, uh, in, uh, India 60, North Korea 10, Israel 200 and 400. Uh, the, uh, this is the suggested number of warheads owned by different countries. Russia owns the largest number. Uh, the United States follows France, China, the UK in the range of 200 to 300. And the non-MPT signatories that refuse to sign the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea. So if we put it in a graph, uh, this is a graph that shows 7,000 warheads owned by Russia, nuclear warheads. Uh, uh, the United States, so almost the same. Uh, France, 300. Why is it that those countries maintain a small stockpile? It's very expensive to maintain a nuclear uh, stockpile of weapons that have to continuously be maintained. As I mentioned, the Russians exploded the largest ever thermonuclear device. This is a replica of that device here. Uh, they named it the Tsar Bomba. Uh, it was designed to release 100 million tons or 100 megatons of TNT. Uh, at the last moment, the scientists removed part of the fusion part and uh, that reduced the yield into 58 megatons. Uh, and that has been the largest ever tested uh, nuclear weapons uh, in 1961. Uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, something is happening to... Okay. Uh, uh, the, bomb, the bomb had been uh, uh, carried by Tupolev uh, uh, 95. Uh, it delivered it uh, uh, in an area of Siberia as, after reducing it from the 100 uh, megaton uh, size of the uh, device. So uh, in uh, the United States, uh, uh, testing has, because the, I, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty has banned nuclear testing, the last United States nuclear device was tested in 1992, shown here as a very long cylinders down into a borehole into the ground. Uh, however, the nuclear uh, power states still uh, uh, have programs to keep, basically that's called the stewardship program. This is a Sierra IBM supercomputer at the Lawrence Livermore lab. Uh, it is air-gapped, meaning that it is kept offline, so nobody can hack uh, into it. Uh, it is just dedicated to uh, the weapons stockpile stewardship programs. Countries like Russia uh, and the other countries do the same. Uh, the uh, warheads are being still uh, being uh, oh, uh, uh, developed. This is a W80 uh, warhead. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, the nuclear power states uh, have not uh, uh, have not uh, lived to their commitments to the elimination of nuclear weapons in general. Uh, the unfortunate part of the uh, MAD doctrine, the Mutual Assured Destruction Doctrine, is that uh, uh, nuclear war uh, is possible, even though it's highly probable, <laughs> improbable, but it is possible. And uh, in that case, if uh, you get, you can get false alarms, you can get system malfunctions, or you can get uh, uh, a near miss, uh, a, 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 an unintended launch, for instance, of a device that would miss its target. And in that case, it's, uh, the name given to it is a broken arrow. And in fact, uh, in 1983, uh, Soviet Lieutenant uh, Stanislav Petrov uh, was uh, detected some launch, uh, suspected launch from the United States against Russia. And his job was to uh, alert his uh, superiors and launch a counter attack. Uh, he uh, uh, kept a cool head and uh, uh, deduced uh, correctly that uh, the United States would not attack Russia with a single uh, device. So uh, he suggested that if the United States would attack Russia, they will launch multiple devices at the same time and did not initiate the alarm in Russia and averted basically a nuclear war. So it should be applauded for his cool head in that case. In the United States, uh, you could see here a weapon uh, two of these were dropped from a B-52 that had an accident flying over, uh, I think, North Carolina. Uh, at the site here, uh, you'll find uh, a sign that says nuclear mishap B-52 transporting two nuclear bombs crashed in January 1961. Uh, widespread disaster averted three crewmen died three miles uh, south. Uh, one of the devices uh, got embedded into the ground and could not be retrieved now because of the groundwater there. So the United States Air Force rented the area and pays the rent and nobody is allowed into it. But the other device, as you could see here, uh, uh, could have uh, exploded. The uh, exploding uh, mechanism was uh, started. Uh, that one was retrieved. Since then, uh, the uh, no nuclear uh, weapon can be flown in uh, planes uh, by the Air Force over the continental United States. So that is a disaster, second disaster that was uh, averted. Uh, there was a situation where a bomber also uh, uh, fell off the coast of uh, Spain and uh, the nuclear devices were retrieved. Uh, nuclear war is a continuous threat. This is what's called the uh, the uh, uh, nuclear football, that bag carried by that uh, officer there follows uh, uh, the United States presence on any trip in, and he's covering him, uh, he's uh, following him on a nuclear helicopter uh, in that case. And uh, uh, here is the uh, nuclear football. It contains the codes that the president of the United States would use. Uh, to respond to a nuclear attack. Uh, this uh, situation here happened in that uh, he was uh, one of the officer in charge was carrying it on a visit of uh, one of our presidents to China and uh, the Chinese uh, security would not allow him and caused a, a diplomatic kind of uh, challenge here. Uh, mutual assured destruction uh, then is the uh, existing game uh, the title of our uh, chapter, The Nuclear World You Are Living In. Uh, nuclear primacy are doctrines uh, that suggest that some nations would be uh, uh, responding to any challenge uh, to its security by using nuclear weapons. That would be Russia. Some nations uh, uh, deny that they can be the first users of nuclear weapons. That would be China. And uh, in 2018, the United States had what that's called the Nuclear Posture Review, uh, renewing basically all the stockpile of nuclear weapons in uh, the United States. So the process of using nuclear weapons is still there. Uh, in a revived arms race in 2018, uh, Russia responded in an asymmetric way uh, by revealing a wish list of 
new sets of weapons. Two of them are, uh, three of them are nuclear, in fact. One is a new uh, uh, anti-ballistic missile, they call it the Sarmat, with a range of 6,200 miles. Uh, that uh, intercontinental ballistic missile can attack the United States from the South Pole, rather from the North Pole, where the United States has a defense system against ICBMs. They show us here the picture of that Sarmat uh, with the multiple uh, MIRV vehicles, and it is a mobile system on trucks all over the extent, the large extent uh, area of the uh, uh, Russia, and it has 15 of those MIRV devices uh, in general. Uh, Mr. Putin suggested also the Puri Vesnik nuclear powered cruise missile. In that case, the suggestion is that uh, they were developing in Russia a cruise missile that is uh, 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 powered by a nuclear reactor. It was a nuclear reactor uh, uh, in contrast to a chemical kind of a rocket that can fly for a very long time because you can have lots of energy in the nuclear reactor. The suggestion is that it can. Uh, maneuver against any kind of defense systems like uh, in cruise, cruise ships in the Pacific in general. And they showed actually uh, pictures of uh, that uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear reactor powered earth hugging radar evading uh, cruise missile. Uh, unfortunately, I had an accident somehow, or fortunately, uh, whatever you want to say, an accident. Uh, when they were testing it and many of the engineers on the project uh, got killed. So we don't know what is the situation with that uh, missile uh, in that case. Uh, they had uh, another uh, uh, system, they call it the Kinzhal or Skander Dagger Air Launch Cruise Missile System. Uh, they show it here uh, being uh, launched from the upper atmosphere uh, to target uh, targets on the ground. Uh, it is surrounded by plasma sheets that makes it uh, invisible to radar. And uh, the kinetic energy of that weapon doesn't need any chemical explosive or nuclear explosives, just the kinetic energy can destroy targets on the ground. And they show here a picture of its uh, development. They have, so that is what's called the Kinzhal or Dagger uh, air launch cruise missile. Uh, they have a hypersonic dodging boost glide cruise missile. That's the avant-garde system uh, that they claim they are developing. Uh, in addition, they are talking about a nuclear powered drone submarine that would be placed near the coasts of the United States with a 10 megaton or 100 megaton weapon exploded near harbor areas that would generate a tsunami that can destroy uh, the uh, port city. They show it here uh, under construction. And uh, it is a drone, meaning that it is not uh, man powered. Uh, and uh, some detail came out on how they would transport it. You could see here reactor. It is uh, driven by a nuclear reactor. Uh, it could be carried under a submarine or inside a submarine. And uh, they show different versions of it. Uh, this uh, picture here was uh, obtained by a mistake where the TV crew uh, took pictures of one of the general uh, briefing uh, the uh, Mr. Putin in a, a meeting uh, in that case. So we don't know exactly how uh, it is, but it's supposed to be a drone. And uh, they show here again how they're constructing it. And uh, they show here uh, the port of uh, San Diego and uh, with a, with a uh, with that type of a drone, a uh, megaton exploding, creating a tsunami that would destroy the port. Uh, they also have a radar system. So they have six kind of, uh, uh, not radar, laser system that would down any uh, uh, satellites from uh, the air. Uh, so uh, this is a part of, uh, of course, uh, somehow uh, uh, violations of the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is being superseded by the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. This is the hope of humanity in abolishing nuclear weapons. So then that basically I have to mention this one. Uh, uh, Honduras became the 50th country to ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And uh, that made it come into uh, force. 
So the discussion that I can uh, talk about this chapter is that uh, we are still under the uh, threat of the uh, MAD doctrine, the mutually assured destruction. And it's not just the United States and Russia, you'll find China uh, taking part uh, in the process. Uh, this is uh, uh, a description from a China uh, magazine showing the uh, attacks by China on the west coast of the United States and the fallout of radiation over the United States. And uh, here they show some of the targets that they're targeting on the east coast of the United States. One of them is Green Bay. And uh, we know that Green Bay is a, a non-military target. It just has the Green Bay Packers. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, this is a, a threat of nuclear war. Uh, China has built what is called, they call the New Great Wall, which is a system of roads and tunnels underground where they move their, uh, their uh, missiles so that they cannot be located by the United States, in addition to some ground-based missiles. The United States also has uh, nuclear missiles in Europe. This is a beautiful missile base in Germany. It contains 20 B-61 devices. Uh, used also uh, uh, in the, by the United States. Uh, in terms of threats uh, uh, of nuclear war, nuclear war is back uh, in the picture. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, as I suggested, uh, uh, we have to uh, take it into account. Uh, the uh, big threat is a, uh, a single device uh, uh, exploded over a large city that can generate a, an electromagnetic pulse that can turn a whole country like the United States back to the Stone Age. The threat is real. Uh, this is a false nuclear missile attack on Hawaii, created a panic with people in January 13th, 2018. A father there trying to convince his daughter to hide in a manhole in the street, supposedly to protect her against a false attack by uh, supposedly North Korea, which had no intention on to happen what uh, so happened uh, uh, in general. So in that case, uh, we live uh, under the doctrine of the mutual assured destruction. Uh, there are treaty violations that are, uh, uh, people are talking about in terms of violating the te uh, nuclear test ban uh, treaty. Uh, the uh, the uh, bulletin of atomic scientists created what's called the doomsday clock and uh, how many minutes before midnight we are from nuclear war. And uh, in that case, a global nuclear war would mean annihilation to the whole uh, human race. Uh, the Soviet first test was in 1949. Uh, we were at uh, maybe 10 minutes before midnight. Uh, we were in 2018 uh, at two minutes before midnight uh, in the atomic clock. And uh, here in uh, 2020, we were at 100 seconds before uh, midnight. And uh, they ascribe that to climate, nuclear, and cyber uh, warfare uh, concerns uh, for our uh, world. Uh, in general, uh, the working dynamic globally appears to be a precipice rule, uh, if I want to describe it, which suggests that sides will argue, shout, and threaten but back away at the last minute before falling into a precipice. Uh, however, in a nuclear world where doctrines of mutually assured destruction, MAD, of nuclear primacy predominate and where there is always a possibility for accidents, uh, miscalculations, uh, blunders, and even brinksmanship uh, to show who is stronger and the survival of the human species and its technical civilization at that stake, uh, military confrontation is excluded. And uh, we have to always think about diplomacy and peaceful dialogue. Uh, they have to stand up as the rational survival alternative for our technological civilization. And uh, I'll stop uh, at that uh, sharing. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, what we can do, what I can do is uh, uh, stay uh, available in the chat room uh, to answer any questions that the he is did not answer.
Oh, by the way, I did mention it in the chat room already. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, record the first two uh, lectures and uh, posted them in the Illinois media space. So if you missed the lectures, you can uh, hopefully find a version of them right there. Thank you, Ishan. Uh, please read the, the notes and there will be a, uh, some question to be answered and submitted to Canvas to our wonderful TAs, uh, Alvaro and Anshal. I'm sorry, Anshal, I couldn't, oh, uh, I couldn't catch you in time to add you as uh, a co-host. Simon Zhang, thank you. I, th I thought that uh, Alvaro could have uh, had you join, but I didn't see you join us. <clears throat> 